welcome to my studio. I'm Susan Smith and my business is Stitch by Susan and I'm here quilting a freehand edge to edge project from beginning to end today. So if you've been here before and you're a returning guest, welcome, thanks for joining me. If you're new, um, this is kind of a newer project that my husband and I are doing. These kind of live and unscripted episodes and in them I usually quilt one project from beginning to end within the one session so that you can see in real time the process that I follow to quilt a quilt. Um, not necessarily, it's not a teaching class and not necessarily the only way to do things, maybe not even the right way to do things, but the way that I do quilts in my studio. So I know that as quilters, generally it's easier to learn from people who've gone before us when we work alongside them, right? Or when we join them for classes or at quilting bees or for, you know, quilting sessions in local shops. But we don't have that option right now. And really at any time with long arms, we don't have the option of, you know, putting our long arm in our pocket and wheeling it to our friend's house and quilting with them. So this is my version of that, where I would invite you into my studio to just see me work through a project and it's interactive so you're welcome to type in comments or questions or even tips if you you know see something that i could be doing differently or better i'm always happy to learn from other quilters too so this is not intended necessarily to be a teaching um, class teaching session so i will be loading the quilt shortly and working my way through quilting it and again it's not so much about the quilting design as just that the process of loading and you know getting my thread organized and basting and keeping the quilt square and those sorts of things I kind of chat about as I'm quilting. If you have a question or a comment, type it into the chat bar. If it's a question particularly, if you would put a capital Q or question in front of it, it will catch our eye a little bit better. My husband is behind the scenes manning the monitors and cameras and as so often when we're working live, the little gremlins get into the studio. So we've got one camera and one monitor down this morning. So that's why you're seeing me in a different view than I sometimes am. So he's having a little more uh, head turning to keep up with what's showing on the screen because he doesn't have a good monitor in front of him. So bear with us as we work through those things and we'll do our best to keep track of the comments. So like I said, big old question in front of them and we will respond throughout the course of the session. And here's one right away. Hello from South Southern West Virginia. We have ice and snow. Oh my goodness, yuck. I agree, yuck. Love your vibe so much. Good morning, it's still frigid in Minnesota. You were here yesterday, yes. Uh, just curious, is your Dan Unger in his early 40s and grew up in San Diego area? Nope. He's a Canadian just like me, he's a Canuck. So, yeah. And any others, Dave? Thanks for saying where you're from, I appreciate you. Someone from Iowa, good, excellent. Good to see you all here this morning. I mean, this is the best way to get together, right? COVID or not, it's great to get together virtually and just be able to spend a little time in each other's studio, in mine today. Good morning, and I don't know who that one's from, a little cup of coffee. Oh yeah, mine's at the other end of the long arm. I'll be grabbing sips of that. Ice in Anna, Texas, oh my goodness. It's cold everywhere, and it is cold here, honestly, too. I'm in Washington State in the inland northwest, so I'm on the eastern side of the state, not the coastal side. And it is cold, but we haven't had snow or even ice. I'm looking out the window. Yeah, no, but it is cold. It is brisk. So without too much further ado, I will get at it. Oh, here's a question. I'm trying to locate some long magnets for my long arm bar. Do you know where I can purchase them? If, they're, if you're in the U.S., I got mine at Harbor Freight. Uh, what are some other tool shops, yeah, Dave? Princess Auto. In Canada, Princess Auto would probably be a good source. It's your kind of box store, hardware store. I mean, even Canadian Tire, those sorts of places would probably have them. In Canada? Oh, 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 okay. Sorry, Dave and I have a little side conversation going here. Okay, so I'm going to... Oh, good morning from super cold Saskatchewan. Well, I know where Saskatchewan is, and I have a pretty good idea how cold it can be, too. So I'm going to move my machine. It's going to kind of get in the way of the camera for a few minutes, but we kind of have to, for the sake of the cords, park it at this end while I load. So here we go. I'm working on a quilt um, like yesterday. My local guild, which is the Washington State Quilters Guild, has a charity program, right, where they produce quilts for, um, for foster kids, for people that are in the hospital or in hospice care. 
And so um, some people do the piecing, you know, some match it up with backing. Others, like myself, do the quilting, and then it goes on to someone else to bind it. So this is just one step in this process. I'll loosen that a little bit. So I am using the red snappers to load. You certainly could do this with pins as well. I did that too for many years. But as you will see, my process does not involve centering or lining up my backing anywhere. And I love that method because it's so speedy. So I am just, I've picked a straight edge to my backing. Usually backings have at least one straight edge. And that's what I'm loading on this front rail. Just gonna get a shorter snapper here. You for the other side. So once I get my straight edge attached, like so, then I just toss the rest of the backing over the back rail and then come and smooth it down. So the way that this stays straight is because I take care to get this running smoothly across. If I were to have it pulled right or pulled left, if I saw any kind of diagonal creases forming in my fabric, that would be a clue. It's not straight and smooth. So I do take care to make this smooth, to make all the fabric that's falling down over my rail um, in a position to pull on straight. So if it were a large quilt, I would smooth it all out across the floor. And then I get my trusty water bottle and I lightly mist those folding creases and I find that is enough for the creases to relax. And that's it, no ironing required. Website for the Red Snappers. I know that Quilts on the Corner sells them and sells the side grippers. So that's one option for sure. And I've had really good customer service from them. I'm sure there are others, but that is one that I know. So now I'm just going to roll it up until my hanging end there just extends beyond where I want to place my red snappers. And I get my extra steps in by running around the end of the long arm, you see. Smooth everything out. The bigger the quilt, the more attention you have to put in making sure that it feeds smoothly. You sometimes have to smooth it out a few times. And if there's seams in it as well. Just a little care and attention. And now when I go to snap or pin this end on, I don't pay any attention to the fabric itself. I trust that it has rolled on straight. And so if this were a jagged edge or you know how wide backings, for example, often have a really crooked edge, I would just let that excess hang off and not have to worry about it. And for me, the time savings in not having to square up client backings is enormous. Around it goes, and we have a smooth thing just like that. And it is a small quilt, mind you, but how many minutes was that? Less than five for sure. I'm using Hobbs 8020 backing, my favorite for kind of all purpose quilts. Light, washable, doesn't crease too badly when you fold them. them. Good price, all the good things. And then this cutie little quilt, I don't know if you can see it. Kind of browns and roses with hits of a golden yellow and a green. And I'm gonna take a second and give this a little spritz too. It's got some long-term folding creases in it. And just that little mist of water is enough to make them relax a bit. There we go. Now this is a small quilt, so it's not too difficult to square up. I'm not gonna 
span my quilting frame with my measuring tape or anything, but I can see looking at it that it's not, it is not perfectly flat. There's a bit of wonkiness in the seam. So I'm just gonna pay a bit of attention as I quilt that I'm getting um, my seam lines nice and straight on here and that I'm keeping my sides you know, parallel to the edge of my backing. If it were a bigger quilt, I probably would load my tape measure across and really be sure that these are coming up on the same measurement, but it's small enough. I'm going to eyeball it. A question, I'll take it. Do you ever quilt with minky or fleece for the quilt backing? Yes, I have not done fleece very often, but I've done minky lots of times. Okay, and I'm seeing something that I probably would have ironed if I had seen it earlier. This whole side edge, it looks like maybe this was a bigger quilt and it was made smaller, so it's got a whole seam allowance pressed in. So, hopefully I can moisten that and require it to lay flat for me. We'll give it a try. Oh yeah, that'll work. And it's still got some threads in it from being unpicked line right on that seam line and then trust that those will get caught up in the binding and I'm not going to stress about it too much. I absolutely love doing projects that are just compassion type projects like this but I'm also I try to be realistic about the time I invest in them. Um, you could spend a ton of time making perfection so as is kind of my motto I try to do it with care but not get too carried away in perfection and that way I can do more of them. <laughs> okay, and I'm quilting with a old country rose. Those of you who are my age will know that phrase, an old country rose color of fabric, or of thread, sorry. And I'm using 100% poly thread. It's pretty much what I always use. Across the top edge, I like to use my channel lock so that I'm really sure of getting a good straight beginning line. Okay, there's a question apparently about loading. Yeah. What if the back seam goes horizontally? That would be the selvage, so the sides may not be straight. If the seam doesn't lay on a bar when loading, how do you know the back and pattern on it would be straight? What am I missing? Well, I've gotta be honest. If the, if the fabric has a very obvious pattern or weave, I'm counting on the quilt maker to have made that pretty straight for me. If she didn't, I'm not going to invest a ton of time in it, if that makes sense, if it doesn't matter to her. So if I don't have a selvage to put along the front edge, then I do try and make sure I have a straight edge to put on the front edge, if that makes sense. You do have to have kind of one straight side to base it off of, and I choose that to be my front edge. Hope that helps. But occasionally you do like I'll get backs in that have a number of seams that are kind of pieced and, and cobbled together. And I'm fine with that. I just do the best that I can to make it straight. And I've, I don't know how to tell you all the things I consider. I have sewn and worked with fabric, I think my whole life. So I'm pretty comfortable kind of manipulating it a bit or pressing it a bit or whatever. I just use my best judgment, but I try and start with one straight edge. Gotta get a sip of coffee in ladies. Ah, 
that hits the spot. I have it usually set at 12 or 13. And these are my trusty magnets for the front, which I talked about yesterday. Um, because I just float my tops, I don't roll them onto a rail. This accomplishes much the same purpose, which is it keeps this top from pulling up as you're quilting a design in here, right? Which otherwise might squinch it together. So this keeps everything nice and flat and smooth. Um, also, my tension here, another quilter showed me this. If you put your fingertips straight up from the bottom, you should be able to clasp those fingertips through the quilt. It should not be so tight that it's like a drum, you know, that you could pop a, a coin off it. Just tight enough to be smooth. That's really all you need. And I'm weird, I always start quilting at the top right corner, or almost always. So that's what I'm doing today too. And I'm quilting a very casual chrysanthemum flower on it. I love this design for the texture that it creates when you wash it. All these little bubbly areas crinkle up in, into such a lovely texture. Whoop! Kind of wung that one, didn't I? take a minute to do my casual tension chest tension check that did not come out right I run a fingernail underneath along a couple of lines of quilting in different areas and run that fingernail really firmly and if your bottom thread is tight you'll hear the laddering of the stitching even if it's not really visible so that's a really good test my maintenance guy told me that and it works fabulously and if I'm having problems, then I fish out my mirror and flashlight and all that sort of stuff. But that's just a good eyeball test of it. And of course, if your top thread is too tight, you'd be seeing it. So I'm pretty confident I'm good to go. And I prefer generally when I'm doing edge to edge designs to work in non-regulated mode. So I'm gonna switch to that. Uh, I mess with pace a lot. So I'm just gonna try one and then we'll come back if we need to and switch it up. I find this to be so much smoother. If you're not used to doing this, I encourage you to give it a try. It can be a bit frightening to begin with when your machine starts just whirring away without you. But I'm working at 55%. You might try starting out a fair bit slower so that it doesn't shock you when it starts going. But the beauty of this is the smoothness, like the machine actually moves a little more smoothly. Um, and I certainly find that the sound of it is more smooth and soothing and I just get a better result. And it's kind of a challenge, honestly, to improve your quilting control because it is important then that you focus on smooth movements, right? Not being jerky and not being, you know, pausing for a long period of time in some places. So that's why you need to figure out your pace slow enough that you've got enough time for your brain to keep up with thinking where to go next and what to quilt next and fast enough to keep it smooth. And that's a bit different for each person.
Each of my chrysanthemum petals are a little more than quarter sized, I would say. If you're a Canadian, they're about the size of a loony. you're probably able to see fairly well on the overhead camera. I'm following my general pattern of movement across a quilt, which is I've started in a corner and then I make my passes kind of diagonal. So I'm going to reach wider on the left here as I get to the top and kind of weave my way diagonally back and forth across the quilt. That keeps me from getting it all quilted in close to me at the front and then having this awkward little area at the back that I can't get to. So up here now I'm gonna take care to put in a couple chrysanthemums to get this a little wider at the top. And I keep moving back and forth in that kind of generally diagonal fashion. The other thing that helps with is it prevents you from setting up all your motifs, whatever they may be, in this case a flower in a row because they're all perforce staggered because of your diagonal movement. This design is super forgiving because you can simply add another row of petals wherever you need some more coverage or if you need to travel to another area, you can even go around a couple of flowers. I'll show you that in a minute doesn't have to be just adding another row of petals to the one you're working on. So just for the sake of argument, I'm just gonna keep traveling around the next chrysanthemum, you see that? So wherever I need to travel to, it's entirely possible. I have no idea how well that honestly shows up on camera, but hopefully you've got a kind of mental picture going on. stopping for a second at the other end I had trouble with my long arm rail bumping up against my side stretcher so I'm just going to put my trusty yardstick in there to hold it up out of the way just a little and that's all there is to this one rinse and repeat My experience working in non-regulated mode, by the way, is that I have a definite sweet spot. So I'm looking for my stitches to be, you know, about 12 to the inch, similarly to what I was getting when it was on regulated mode. But also the speed needs to be just right for getting smooth curves on the one hand and for being able to travel without feeling rushed on the other hand. And if I were to make this go too much faster, you know, I could stitch faster, but then I start feeling rushed and I get a little jittery and, oh, where do I go next? And then I know that I've exceeded my personal speed limit when I start feeling that way. And often just changing it by two or 3% will be enough to just make that little bit of difference.
And I'm going to travel back up because I know there was a little piece up in this corner. Right here. It needs a bit of attention. And then I'll travel back down. And now we will advance. Just like that. This will be a quick project. We have three or maybe four passes, that's all. Sure, let's have some questions. So you don't even have a leader on your bar for the quilt top? Have you ever had success using the magnet on top of the rolled up leader? Uh, I'm not sure where you mean. Let me get over there for a second and I'll point. Okay, you don't even have a leader on your bar. Okay, run that by me again, Dave, please. No, but for the quilt top. I don't have a leader on my bar for the quilt top, no. Did you see me basting it to the top edge of the quilt? That's what keeps it affixed to the back straight and square. Let me know if that does not answer and I'll come back around to it. Aha, my machine only goes to 50%, that's why it's too slow, yeah. I mean, I'm working at 55 now, which is not a ton faster, but like I said, two or 3% sure can make a difference. And there are some designs I do as high as 65, depending, the more corners they have, the more I have to keep it throttled down or else you get, you know, 10 stitches right in that little corner. And I can ask where she recommended getting the snappers. Haven't seen them in use and I like what I see. Yes, they're great. And the same uh, quilts on the corner, I think is what it's called. That lady's name is Renee. And she has done some videos that are much more comprehensive than what I showed you this morning. So you got to see them just kind of at full speed, how I use them in the morning. But she talks through some more of the process. But I have not found anything faster. And I'm approaching a thousand quilts. So I've loaded quite a few. Um, I've not found anything faster. Pins are perfectly adequate, but they do take longer. Also, I have a whole series of t-shirts with holes on the front from running into the pins right, right here. Okay, Dave's talking, talking here. So I got my red snappers, not initially directly from the supplier. I got them from a lady who didn't care for them, but I have since added the side clip. So this was the side that the size that came with my original set and it's got the little clip that opens and it fits onto the side here. Well, they do wear out. You can see on this one on mine, maybe you can see the end is actually breaking. So it does not hold anymore at this end. So I replaced them and their new model, and this is not quilts on the corner. This is the Red Snapper Company now has a new model and it is different and it takes getting used to, but it does come as a set with the Red Snapper rods. So the way those rods work is really simple too. On my leader, it has a hem and there's a slim little rod that slides through that hem. And then the clips, which you saw me using, just snap. They're like a U-shaped clip that just snap over top. So it's a simple system, but it works really well. My machine starts shredding top thread when I try to do waves from the right to the left. Is there a trick to stop that from happening? Well, yes and no. That is a really common thing that long armors say is my machine won't sew from right to left. I'll tell you some things that I know of that you can try. And I would talk to your dealer about this too. Try turning your needle. So when your needle, when you're inserting it, you're instructed to always put it with the eye and the little belly directly facing you. And you, you're told to like put a pin in it to make it straight or use a magnet to make sure it's straight. Try shifting it just a little bit. So if this is 6.30 on your clock, try between 6.25 and 6.30. Like I'm talking a little tiny shift of the needle to the right or the left. And what that does is slightly changes the timing when your needle goes down and the rocker goes over it and catches it to form a stitch. It just slightly changes that timing. And sometimes that slight change will be enough to enable you to stitch from right to left. So give that a try. That's the most effective trick that I've learned. And I want to take my constant off to do my basting. Uh, 
and I'm talking and I really want to put, I like to do my basting before I put any tension on the backing. So I just took my clip back off there. Whether you use Red Snapper or other brands, and there are other makers of side clamps too. No matter which brand you go with, I do strongly recommend a type that has one long holder as opposed to individual clamps pinching in little places, which tend to make a scalloped look on the side of your quilt. So based on, oops, based on the throat space of your machine, get a nice wide clamp that fits in this area. I get to talking and forget to do my things that are kind of second nature, like for example, cutting my thread. <laughs> You'll probably see when I go to take this off, it, it does not hold at this end, as I mentioned. There's no, there's no tension there. That's why I've got my clamp kind of um, emphasized at this end. I mean, cool thing, things do wear out. They just do. I've had these for a few years. I've used and used and used them, so such is life. The new model just has a very slim channel for the fabric. And as I'm using it, I'm getting used to it, as you do with things. I'm getting the hang of getting my fabric inserted into that little channel. So once again, I will take a second to check that the front of my quilt is nice and straight with my seams running across here. Okay, Margie has a question. I don't see a leader on the two bars closest to you. Like here? True. I've, but this will vary by machine, right? So it's hard to say what's what on your machine. My backing is attached to my leader that says top. That's just my personal choice. I use that. Um, so it's kind of underneath and it comes around this belly bar right here and is attached over here. So this does not have any leaders on it. That's true. That is just a bar around which my quilt is held taut. But I think that that really varies by machine. Back to constant. There again, I've chosen to just add some more petals all the way around two of the chrysanthemums. I need to get my yard stick in here because I wanted to travel over to the left edge. I saw that I was getting some undone area over there. And so those, those bubbles, though they don't go around a flower, will look seamless when it's all said and done. I just bubbled my way over to where I wanted to be. I'm just putting a bit of tension on the quilt top with my left hand. Um, there's just a little bit of excess fabric going on over here. And this is just an easy way of ensuring that it goes in, you know, evenly and is taken up by these bubbles as opposed to getting it all in one place and forming a pleat. Generally, I am a two-hand quilter, but it does pay to be able to quilt with one hand certain times and seasons. I find I can go faster if I have two hands going because it does take a certain amount of 
uh, energy somehow in your body to, s to control this 50 pound machine, right? So to do it with one hand, I find really takes a toll on my shoulders over time. So I do prefer to quilt with two hands whenever I can. This little quilt is a great example of just one of the reasons why I love freehand edge to edge so much. Even, I mean, quilting pantographs is called freehand too, so I don't, there's not really a different term for what I'm doing, but the ease of just being able to load a quilt top as you saw and just embark on quilting, uh, the speed at which I can do that and not have to worry about setting up my paper design and I'm not a pantograph expert, so if I say this incorrectly, forgive me, but you know, you have to line up your needle with your beginning point and kind of get that synchronized. And then every time that you advance your quilt, you've got to do a bit more of the same to make sure that it nests well with what you did previously. All that mental acrobatics is, is done by just quilting this freehand. I just get to decide with my eye what fits here and you know, I, need, I don't want this corner to be left undone and I don't want to overlap previously stitched lines. I just do that all on the fly as I go. And I like doing that. I don't know that this is for everyone, but I love doing that. And it is so incredibly much faster, I think. I'm just gonna stop and take that big thread out before I stitch it firmly in place. Here I've got a slim little corner, so I'm just going to wing it. Just putting in a few smaller flowers with one row of petals until I get out of that corner. That's what I'm trying to avoid, honestly, by doing the diagonal method. But inevitably it happens now and again because I'm laying a big six inch flower against another big six inch flower, right? So I just add in a few petals or another curlicue to fill in the awkward place. And again, once this quilt is washed, all you'll see is these little more or less evenly sized 
bubbles or pebbles, not not pebbles, petals. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, and you'll just see texture. You will hardly even see the individual flowers. Time for another advance. quite do it. That being the case, I'm going to back up a little bit so that I have enough top hanging over the edge that I can put my magnetic bars on there to hold it still and in place. Okay, let me just base this and then we'll talk about a couple of questions that are coming in. That side was a little bit crooked, so I just did a straight row of stitching, and I will trim this up before I send it on to the binder, so I'll have this side all nice and trimmed straight for her. I'm just going to run over this a little bit, so can you see it with the other camera for a second, Dave? I don't know if you can see there, there's some, you know, bubbles and puckers and some strong easing has been going on. Again, I just use my best judgment there. So I've put a little bit of tension on the areas that are tight, but basically I need to put the, pull the excess in because if I pull too tight, it may look good while it's on my quilting machine, but as soon as I release the tension on the bars, that will pull up that area of the quilt. So general rule of thumb is you've got to pull in the excess, not stretch the shortened bits to fit, if that makes sense. This is an excellent quilting design for doing that. Any curved element is very efficient at pulling in excess fabric. So all these little petals are custom designed just for that. So I'm just going to fluff my excess and kind of evenly distribute it so that my bottom edge is straight because I can see it here now. And that's all going to get quilted in. Okay, let's have a question or two. Some companies call that clear view. I don't actually know what you're referring to. I'll just take your word for it. In the master class, we've learned several different flowers. Do you ever quilt a variety of flowers in the same quilt? Um, occasionally, not usually on a cust on a edge to edge design. And I guess that's just personal preference, but I kind of want the same texture to be over the entire quilt top. But the, you know, you certainly could. There's nothing stopping you. Yeah. Do you know what is the difference between rayon thread versus polyester thread? Hmm. Can't say I do, and I don't know that rayon threads are very common in quilting. I know my eye was first caught by the brand I use, which is Isacord because they initially manufactured threads for embroidery machines, which are also high speed, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of stitches um, of thread. And so you need that low lint and you need the strength level. And polyester delivers all of that. I can't honestly say that I've ever used a rayon. Give it a try. Is it more difficult for you when you have a smaller area to quilt as you do now? plus a much smaller area to quilt on your next pass. Not particularly, this is not tiny. When I do, you know, samples for teaching and they're 12 inches, then it is a little harder because you're, you seems like you're always in a corner or at an edge and trying to maneuver your way around. But this is, this is fine for maneuvering around. When you advance with the needle down, it doesn't put too much pull on the needle. That's an excellent question. Generally, I find no. The only time that I do cut thread is when I'm doing parallel horizontal lines, which I was actually doing last night. You might see a picture of that later today. And I do find it does then. If I'm spacing lines a half an inch apart or something like that, and I advance with my needle in, it will mess up the straightness of the next line. So obviously it does have a small effect. 
I find it to be negligible on a quilt like this. No one will ever notice. Clearview is only with Handy Quilter, newer style frame. It really isn't that much different. Ah, okay, good to know. So that's a term for their brand, basically. That's. Oh yeah, let's see a poll. What was the poll, Dave? While he's hunting for the pole, I didn't mention this morning, I quilt on a Gamel Elevate, and it is a 26 inch throat. So it's a fair size machine. And as you can see, I, I keep my machine quite high, I think compared to what a lot of quilters do, because such a high percentage of my work is edge to edge, and I prefer working at this height as opposed to, you know, working six inches lower. That's again, my preference. I've fiddled with it at a few different heights. We have a poll. What time of day or week is best for you to catch these lives and unscripted? Weekdays work smirk. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Working for the weekend, anytime works. Easy like Monday morning. Well, there you go. That's good to know, though, because I will make an effort to do some of them on weekends so that more people can catch them. Because one day is kind of like <laughs> another for me. There's hardly a day that I don't quilt. So, okay, back at it. Have I got everything done? Because sometimes when I talk, I forget what I'm doing. And I was on this side, so I'll start back at this side. It doesn't vastly matter with this design, but with some designs, that helps you too, to keep them not aligned, to do oppo uh, passes in opposing directions. And I want constant back on. Just, just taking a visual here to see where I am. Good to go. This is my area, remember, that had the excess fullness. So I'm trying to make sure I don't 
just shove it ahead of me. I want to actually work it into my pebbles. I keep saying pebbles, I mean petals. While I'm quilting, a shout out to my husband who is, as always, doing the behind the scenes work and keeping cameras, monitors, cables and wires, etc. going. And also to my friend Dan Unger, who has provided the gorgeous music that we have playing this morning. He is a fantastic guitar player and musician in general. Not sure if you can see on the green floral that's down here. I can kind of see diagonal pulls on the fabric. That's my visual cue that I've got some excess there that needs my attention. So as I get close to that area, I will, I will just be paying attention. I won't just mindlessly be quilting or I will end up with a problem area. I will actively work to get that excess in smoothly and when it's all said and done nobody but me will be any the wiser another thing i absolutely love about quilting completely freehand and you know on the fly is that i can deal with those things on the spot you know if i had my computer going i would either have to be standing over it holding the fabric or i would come back when it's all said and done to find some nice pleats quilted in there for me but this way I can manage it and manipulate it as necessary and I can make this quilt look its very best. I was actually reading a post on Facebook the other day. Um, someone was a, a new quilt maker and she was looking for a long armor and she made a comment about she had been turned down by a couple of long armors that didn't care to quilt for new makers and to me that's something that I want to be able to do I want to develop the skill and be able to take someone's quilt you know whether it's a newbie or I quilt frankly for lots of very elderly ladies you know their eyesight's not that great their piecing's not that precise um, but I want to be able to make those quilts look the best that I possibly can that is just my personal challenge any questions, Dave, or comments going on? Oh, well, good. You want to hear the music. It's yeah, awesome. Okay. Yeah, yep. Yes, I try and post pictures um, on social media of the projects. Um, sometimes the same day. Sometimes I wait till I get some good light to show off the quilting. Just depends. On certain days, it just show no matter how hard I try. And I can see that this area in the middle, which is where, especially this, which is where I'm dealing with the tight fabric, is a little bit shorter. So because I'm not cutting off any points or anything, I'm just going to buzz my border in about a half an inch on this edge to make a nice straight edge. I kind of have to make a decision there. It's either going to be straight or it's gonna use every possible bit of the quilt that I have, and I've chosen the straight. And we're gonna lose a quarter of an inch. In this brown, we're gonna lose 3 eighths of an inch of quilt, and I'm okay with that. Now, you know, if it were little stars there and they had nifty little points, that would be another thing. I'd have to do it differently, but. There we go. And once again, that's a service I offer is trimming up after the quilting. 
done. And so I will just trim that edge nice and straight and ready to be bound. Yeah, Dave tells me I'm getting faster at that other clip and it's true. I mean, that's true of so many things in life, right? When you get more and more familiar with it, you do inevitably get better at it. It's looking pretty good. Any more questions or comments before I dive in again? <laughs> and you can, by the way, um, ask questions or make comments later, and I do come back and read them and respond to them, so, or at least I really try to. So. If you do have to work schmirk today, you can always pop in and watch later and still ask questions about what I'm doing and I will come back and gladly answer them. There's that green fabric. Remember that I saw the lines, you know, the oddly spaced pulling across and so I'm just putting a wee bit of tension on it with my fingertips so that it feeds smoothly under the needle. I've told this story before, but I'm going to tell it again. When I bought my first long arm, which was in 2015, I think, um, the lady that I bought from was, at the time, seemed like a very experienced quilter to me. Now looking back, I realize, you know, she really had only quilted for herself. But anyway, she's showing me all the tips that she knows to apply to the machine. And she's got hanging on her wall a reminder to not stretch too tight with the side stretchers. And her reminder, not a word of exaggeration, she had actually torn the fabric she had pulled so tight. And I don't mean undone sewing seam stitches. She actually tore the fabric by pulling her quilt so tight. And it was in an effort to control these wrinkles and excess um, folds of fabric, right? Because fabric is malleable and it's never going to be perfectly smooth and flat. So you have to manage it in some way so her way of managing it was just pull her tighter. And yeah, so that was a lesson for me before I ever got started, that that's not the best solution. So as I showed you at the beginning, I do use tension across my quilt, but it's not drum tight tension, it's just snugness. And the rest I manipulate as I go. And then the other thing, which I mentioned already earlier, but it, it bears repeating, is that it does not work well in the long run to pull your quilt square. So if you've got excess in one area and it's pulling tight in another, pulling the tight area to create you know, a straight edge on the edge of your quilt will not result in a straight edge because as soon as you release the tension on the long arm rails, that tight area is gonna pull back right up into place and you're still gonna have a wonky edge on your quilt. So you've got to somehow ease in that excess fabric or trim off as I've done in the case of this one. I have nice straight chunky blocks so I was able to do that. But pulling the snug one even tighter is not going to fix your problem in that case.
Whoops. Did you guys see that? With one eye, I was trying to peel the errant thread off the quilt top, and I managed to make a loop in one of my little bubbles. I'm going to fudge this one. I'm a master at fudging. So that is one solution when you get yourself into a corner. There's no quilt police watching, so if you have to cross over previously quilted lines, you just do what you've got to do. And that's it. Our little quilt is finished. Okay, I am ready. Do you have zippered roller deals? Is that how you check your bottom tension? I do have zippered leaders. Uh, yeah, no, you can't quite see it. There's a zipper running along here. Um, but that's not really how I check my tension. Now, I've just got, it's open underneath my quilt, right? So I did my little fingernail running along the bottom stitches, check. And if I really need to see something else, like whether there are any pleats under there, then I've got a handheld mirror and a flashlight on my smartphone and I crawl under there and have a look. Sometimes I can see from the other side of the machine, I can just run my mirror along with a flashlight. Those are the ways I check. Have you always quilted on gamma long arms? Is Lucy 2 number two machine for you? Yes, I've always quilted on a gamma, like for my business. I have quilted on other friends' machines and at dealerships on other machines. And Lucy is number two machine for me. Yes, Lucy 2.0 and number two machine. Good for you, Susan. When I first started piecing, I learned tons from my quilter. I didn't know what I didn't know. She did. Truth. And you know, because I quilt a lot for clients, I kind of get a feel for them and whether they want to advance their skills or whether they're just comfortable where they're at. And sometimes I'll ask them like, would you like to know how to make these borders smoother? Because it wouldn't take you any more time and it would be a lot easier and nicer looking and easier for me in the long run. So I feel my way around, but you're absolutely right. I think that as quilters, there are lots of piecers who, who don't know if they've never worked on a long arm they have no sense of some of the things that we deal with or decisions we have to make unless we educate them right i'm with you susan that's why i like and follow you i bought lots of paper pantos at the beginning and now they sit rolled up in a box i really despise doing them so i'm learning to do more like you i'm glad and and i confess i'm not experienced at doing pantos i have never done them so i don't really have a comparison to offer but I've been to classes where they teach you how to do them and I see all the mechanics of that and I see the expense in it. And I love the originality of quilting freehand. So for lots of reasons, I love just winging it like this. When basting side seams, do you use channel locks? I have heard no because the quilted area draws toward the center. Therefore, side seams need slant out thoughts. Um, I do often use the channel locks. You know, again, because I've done this a bajillion times, this quilt, for sure, you saw me eyeballing it, and I'll eyeball my way straight down. The more advanced project that I'm working on, the more careful I am about those details. But I would say, to me, that the reason that you cited, that 
it gets pulled in toward the center is not a reason not to. I think if you want a really straight line on the side, I would use the channel lock. And then you put your nice long clamp on the side and you put your, either you roll up your top or if you float it, you put your magnets on the front and that is fixed. That's not going anywhere when you quilt. So, I mean, it will want to pull in from the sides, but it won't because you've got it attached everywhere, right? So it won't pull in until you release it off the frame. So channel locks are a great tool. Use them whenever you want help making a straight line. Any more? Is that it? I, have this one. I love that attitude so much. To help others create a thing of beauty is a great gift. Yeah, and I'm in a position as a quilter to be able to add a level of beauty to the things that piecers make. And you know, to some people, quilters are very generous. I've, I've heard some complain and I've met the odd piecer who's a bit demanding in the things that she wants, but for the most part, Quilters are such generous people and the piecers are so grateful. Some of them that maybe are inexpert and they're so thankful when I give a quilt back to them that's nice and square and flat and trimmed and they know it wasn't that way when it arrived and they're like, thanks for doing that. And I'm like, absolutely. I love to be able to add my skill to your project and make it look the best it possibly can. Very cool. Will we be learning about stitching in the ditch during this class? As in during these episodes or as in during my mats master class, which I'm currently teaching on another platform? If you'll clarify that, I'll answer it. And I'll go ahead and unload the quilt while you ponder that. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's the limit of my wire. Well, I can do it there if that's okay, because then the machine's not in the way. I've Lucy is tethered, so I can only go so far with her. I always start with my leader hooked over this front rail and attached. So when I unload a quilt, I just park it right back there so it's ready to start for the next one. She's asking about the master class. She's asking about the master class. Um, no, I'm not going to be stitching in the ditch in the master class. To me, that doesn't qualify really as freehand quilting. That's more of a custom quilting technique. You may very well see that in some of these live episodes because occasionally I will do over several days a custom project and that would involve some stitching in the ditch. I don't consider that a freehand technique though and that's what the master class is all about. Fair enough. So I'm going to unload it and hold up the back of the quilt to the camera a little bit for you because the quilting does show up on the back unlike yesterday which had a super busy back that we couldn't even see the quilting on. And then I will post pictures later today as well. If I can get some good light shining across the quilting. Sure, comment from Sam. Trimming client quilts, actual square ones are few and far between. Do you just follow the existing edges or do you cut into the quilt? I don't cut into the quilt. Um, I don't. So I, Often my basting will be slightly less than a quarter inch away from the edge so that when I trim a quarter inch from my basting, they can actually see. I've utilized all their fabric and a few threads more because I don't want to short them anything. And for sure, if there are points on that edge, for sure, I don't want to cut them off. So, and I do have the occasional client actually that prefers to do their own. Maybe they don't want to run that risk. Maybe they want a wider one. I don't know, it doesn't matter. They just specify that and then I don't trim. What if I... Oh, so Dave's asking a question here, which is related, which is what do I do if I do the binding? Because that is another of the services I offer is 100% machine binding, like finished, you get back a finished quilt. So in that case, it's kind of my choice, right? But I still don't want to cut off any of their points at all, at all, or take away from the size of the quilt at all. So if anything, I leave a little excess, but I like it trimmed to a quarter inch and I do two and a quarter inch um, binding. Okay, can we see it? So I know you can't really see the design necessarily, but you get the idea of the texture, right? And when that is washed, oh, it's just lovely, just lovely. So that's the chrysanthemum. As always, thanks so much for watching. This will be um, replayable 
on my Facebook page and on my YouTube page probably by tomorrow. I was late due to going for my COVID jab. Oh, poor you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but, you know, maybe things are looking up. Um, yeah, so it'll be on YouTube again, the replay as well. And you're welcome to comment and I will come back and answer questions. If you watch on YouTube, I would appreciate if you would like and subscribe. And after you've subscribed, if you pound on the bell button, you'll get a little ding every time there's a new episode up. So that can be helpful. So thanks for watching and I will catch you next time.